welcome to another episode of Chax Chat. Join Chad Chilius and me, Dax Castro, where each week we wax poetic about document accessibility topics, tips, and the struggle of remediation and compliance. So sit back, grab your favorite mug of whatever, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dax Castro, and this week's episode of Chax Chat is sponsored by Creative Pro. In fact, Chad and I are speaking at two upcoming Creative Pro events that you should know about. The first one is Creative Pro Week, which is July 8th through the 12th in Washington, D.C., and it's live streamed online. So uh, Creative Pro Week is an essential event for design professionals who use InDesign, Illustrator, Photoshop, and PowerPoint. Chad and I are presenting several accessibility sessions at Creative Pro Week. So if you're anywhere in the D.C. area or you can get there, this is a great opportunity to meet learn some good skills, get your questions answered. And the next event is October 8th through the 11th for the fifth annual Design and Accessibility Summit. And Chad and I have actually been tagged to be uh, producers for that event. And so we are putting together all the speakers and I can tell you this lineup is great. You are gonna be so um, enriched and fulfilled by attending the accessibility, the design and accessibility summit that's happening online, right? It is an online event, October 8th through the 11th. So head on over to creativepro.com to get more information about those two events. So today we don't have Chad. So that's why you're like, wait a minute, where's my normal intro? Where's my, that, that same banter that we have back and forth. But the great thing is we have with us a special guest, Kristen Waitaki, who is a content creator at Tamman and she is blind. So she is a native AT user and welcome to the program, Kristen. Thank you so much for having me, Dax. I really am honored to be here. Awesome. Well, we wanted to have you on the podcast because, you know, as content uh, remediators, our job is to make sure that that content is accessible for people who use assistive technology. And we know that not everyone who uses assistive technology is blind, but we tend to think of that as the base level of who are who who we're doing this work for. And we wanted to have you on the podcast because as a sighted person, I can only approximate what that experience is like. I can say, well, I think someone might use bookmarks more than a TOC or vice versa, or that they're going to want to interact in a specific way, but it's only my guess. And so while we have you on the program, not as speaking for everyone who is blind, um, you and I have worked through a couple documents already kind of offline as we've been uh, partnering with uh, Tamman and, uh, it's your perspective is really interesting to me. And I, so I wanted to have you on the program to kind of talk through a few thing, things. So welcome for, you know, to the program. Well, thank you. And you are an excellent, you both are excellent approximators of the experience. So I really appreciate all the work you've put into learning it. So. Awesome. Well, I think part of it goes to the fact that I, I know that Chad and I both use um, uh, NVDA and JAWS. Uh, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And so when you start using it on a daily basis, just because you don't have sight doesn't mean you don't really become a, you aren't considered a native AT user. I, I probably use it about an hour, uh, hour or more a day, I would say on average. So that's, that's the way to build up any, you know, language proficiency or AT proficiency. Yeah. That's great. Well, Chad is a Duolingo guy, man. He is nice. always on that Duolingo. So he is constantly learning new language and he's doing really good with his Spanish. So I am going to talk about that then. So cool. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, you know, we as remediators, we get this question a lot. Uh, how do I know what settings that I should have in my NVDA or JAWS when I'm testing my document so that I can approximate what another person's experience might be. And we always tell people to leave things at the default setting, because while some people may have certain customizations that we can't adjust for every one of those. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what are some of the things that you've customized in JAWS or NVDA? And, and first of all, maybe which one, which one do you use on a regular basis? I use JAWS. Um, I need to meet NVDA David sometime soon. Or Mark, I don't know, Liza was telling me about the banter sure. of the different voices. So um, the JAWS has a lot of settings you can customize. I would say one that I would not change if you were new to AT is the speed. Uh, but right. I definitely speed it up. Uh, as you get more and more comfortable with it, you can listen faster and 
um, that saves time, which is amazing. Uh, one thing that you can change if you're new to assistive technology is the voice. Uh, I think sure. you should change the voice to whatever's comfortable for you. Um, I personally have it on the least human sounding voice because when I first started using it, so I'm 40, in my 40s, but I started using it in high school and I was like, I cannot stand these half human sounding or like almost human sounding. Oh, I think it's wow. called the okay. uncanny valley effect or something. Sure, so sure. I couldn't take the uncanny valley. And so my screen reader is very robot. So I don't recommend that for people who are scared of a screen reader or just want to feel comfortable. I, I recommend mm -hmm. doing the opposite. Find a voice that you're like, oh, yeah, I understand this voice. Um, well, I have you know. I have quite a few voices. And in fact, mm -hmm. with JAWS, what people, people may not be aware of is you can actually tell it to use one voice mm -hmm. while you're in a document and one voice for another voice for the yes. operating system. And yeah. I think that's a really great benefit because then if I'm not really sure what's telling me, you know, what the prompt is from which side of the equation, it makes it nice because I do use a British voice for the in the in, inside um, uh, the PDF. And then I use a female voice for the uh, the in the, uh, the the Windows environment. So for me, that's just helpful. And I will tell you, I my speed right now is and I use NVDA. So it's a little different, but I have rate boost on and okay. I am at about 35. Nice. So okay. I've I've passed all the way through the normal one, zero to 100%. For those of you who don't know, NVDA has two modes. It has normal speed, and then it's got what I call warp speed. And so when you get through, you, usually you start out at like 25 or 30% on regular speed. And as you progress, you'll get to a point where 100 is just not fast enough. And so you can turn on it's called rate boost, but I call it warp speed. You turn on warp speed and then you have a whole nother zero to 100 you can go to. And uh, so I'm, I, you know, I find it's, it, it's, it's comforting because I'm getting, my comprehension is getting more and more and more uh, uh, complete rather than it's just, you know, I'm not just hearing the, the, the vocalization. I'm actually understanding what's being said. So. I find it fascinating that your document voice is British. So you're, you know, anything that's badly labeled or something that you're remediating or just not tagged well, uh, you get this British accent telling you about the problems. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's true. I think I just find it very eloquent and official, I think, is yeah. my thing. Yeah. Right. So what are some of the settings that you have customized? Not necessarily what people mm -hmm. might want to do, but what are the ones that you have customized? Well, the speed is the big one. Um, I sure. turn off all the tutor messages because at okay. some point it's sort of like, I wasn't actually trying to do that. Don't tell me to do something else, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I have those turned off. They can be useful. Um, there are different kinds of messages you can um, leave on or turn off in JAWS. So there's sure. like messages for access keys and messages for menus, things like that. Um, I do still have it on beginner verbosity. And okay. I haven't really played with intermediate or advanced, but part of it is just that I like to edit and I'm always aware of, you know, if there's a post with a, a misspelling or a little punctuation deviation or something, I like to be aware uh -huh. of those things. So I don't skip out on that. Well, it's interesting. You know, we tell people we get a lot of math documents mm -hmm. um, where there are tables with lots of data in it. And one of the things that we know is that people in certain mathematical worlds, usually banking worlds, um, they put uh, negative values inside parentheses. So mm -hmm. rather than having a negative a minus sign, they use parentheses. And what's interesting is if you don't have the verbosity or the speech mode uh, set in your screen reader the way it needs to be to hear those, they don't get voiced. So yeah. you have no idea if the number is 126, that's a whole, you know, 126 million. It's a whole difference between negative 126 right. million and positive. <laughs> Very different. Very different scenario. Yeah. Awesome. So, okay. So, ver so speed and verbosity. Anything else? I think that's it. The voice, um, like I was saying, okay. I have and the voice, very robotic. Right? Yeah. But yeah. But definitely, when you're starting out, pick a voice you love and you go with it. Yeah, absolutely. So, my series right, is so Irish, for example. So. Yeah. Oh, really? See, yes. I can't do Irish. I, I can, I can listen to a lot of languages, a lot of dialects that uh -huh. that I just understand. Yeah, but Irish and and Scottish to me, you might as well be 
speaking Mandarin Chinese because I just yes. my brain just has a really hard time processing the words because they're just similar enough, but just different enough to really throw my brain off. It's true. You know? Yeah. So one of the other things that we wanted to talk about was that, you know, uh, um, a lot of people think that every AT user is an expert. Right. That just because you have to use this every day that you must be really good at it. And, you know, you know, there's a feature that I always talk about. There's a way in JAWS. It's not an NVDA, but in JAWS to set an anchor point. So let's mm -hmm. say I have a document that has a footnote, but it's not it, it's uh, it doesn't have a reciprocal link. So I can put a marker in JAWS and say, OK, this is my remember this spot. I'm going to click on this link and go somewhere else in the document. Yeah. And then I can recall that and come back to that exact spot, whether the PDF had that feature in it or not. And, and I, and, and I've often talked to people who you are native AT users and they're like, I had no idea that feature even existed. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I knew there was something kind of similar in Word, but I haven't played enough with Adobe. So definitely, yeah. so true. Yeah. I think everyone is on their life journey, you know, and sure. I have a lot of experience with AT. And then there are always, first of all, there are always new commands coming out and new features, some of which right. I try and some of which I don't. And, uh, and also there are just different fields. Like you need certain commands for different fields. The great thing about AT is you can learn like four commands and get a lot better at it than you were when you started and, and get pretty far. So yeah, um, I you agree. Know, you don't need to know everything. Well, and that's what I tell people who are trying to test documents. So like, oh, mm -hmm. I can't test a document with a screen reader. That's too complicated. Can you hit the down arrow? Right. Can can you can you, can you press the H key? <laughs> yes. I mean, the H, H key. key or G. I mean, it's not. You know, if, for those of you listening. It, the 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 most I think the biggest barrier to people using assistive technology is, or at least JAWS and NVDA, is understanding how to turn it off, how to right. silence it momentarily. They install JAWS or NVDA, all of a sudden it's talking, talking all this stuff, them. and everywhere you move your mouse. So one of the first things we teach people is that for NVDA, it's insert S that toggles the speech mode to mm -hmm. on, off, or beeps. And then with JAWS, that is insert space bar. You wait for that little click, and then you press the S. So uh -huh. almost the same, but a little different. And then the other one we teach people is to turn mouse tracking off. Okay. In NVDA, you can tell NVDA to stop voicing everything my mouse touches. So that way, it's a little bit less of a uh in your face experience right mm -hmm, listening mm -hmm. to all those words versus you know now i can purposely walk through the document once you learn those things and then we teach that the shift key um is the the stop nvda temporarily like it's speaking and you just want it to shut up right then yeah um, be because it doesn't actually have a function for any other key most every other key on your keyboard does something shift really doesn't do anything so it's nice that you don't accidentally jump to the next page or the next graphic or something and control in jaws will it will it tell it shut up jaws <laughs> like just for a second ah, awesome so, so control yeah. is the same kind of way so awesome yes. that's really great so can I ask you then, how do you prefer to walk through a document? You've got a document you've never seen before, and you are, you're wanting to get an idea of what it is, or, I mean, walk me through the, the way that you kind of approach a document. So if there's a table of contents, that's always helpful to just get an idea of the information and maybe even the structure and then headings uh -huh. are super super important to me i feel like heading if there's no he heading i already start to go oh no here we go especially if it's a big document uh headings really provide that outline level that i don't really care about anywhere else and sometimes probably don't write as well as i enjoy to read but yeah headings are super important so question about that so so we actually you know we for those of uh our audience who are new to the podcast, we have a Facebook group called PDF Accessibility. And someone recently just said, hey, I have a TOC in my document. Do I need to make it hyperlinked? Do I need to make it active? Does that fail accessibility? Does it fail PDF UA or fail Section 508? My answer to them was no, it doesn't. It's not required to be a link. But I got to believe, Kristen, that if your first 
you know, first uh, uh, inspection of a document is does it have a TOC that right. having links would make it really helpful for uh, you, links right? Are, links are really a nice perk to have, I think, because it, it's somewhat of the equivalent of people who don't use AT being able to jump around a document really right. quickly. So, yes, I agree. Uh, on the topic of TOC, there is a bug within the JAWS and NVDA where... Mm -hmm. Well, it's not really a bug. I would say it's a uh, the the standard and the reality are kind mm -hmm. of at odds with each other. That's true. So it, in 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 PDF UA, it says your TOC should have a very specific tag structure, but JAWS or NVDA both will read will voice the word link when they get to a reference tag. Mm -hmm. And then they will voice the word link again when they get to a link tag. But in a TOC, the proper structure is TOCI reference and then link. So for you, every if I do it properly, you're going to hear link, link every time you walk through that TOC. Uh. Is that something that you consider a barrier or just an annoyance or you don't really even notice it? What are your thoughts? Uh, that would be an annoyance. And actually, it makes me think that if the TOC is not active, then that's why sometimes it can seem like it is and it actually isn't. So okay, I'd much awesome. have, rather have Link Link and have an active TOC and just be annoyed. Gotcha. But that is interesting. So, so your answer is, well, I, some accessibility is better than no accessibility, right? Yes, I'd rather have yes. it be, I'd rather have it be active and say link, link than not active at all. So yes, exactly. Th there's a simple fix for that. But the, the, what happens is, is that you have to go into each TOC item and change the parent tag from reference to paragraph. And then you only hear the one link. Um, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to do. And if you're not using a tool like Common Look or Access PDF, it's a little harder. It's a little bit more of a manual process to kind of find those and 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 make all those changes. So um, I want to ask you, uh, so you, you start out by looking at the TOC, then you mm -hmm. go to the headings. There's a feature that for whatever reason, I just thought was so useful, but... I find most people who are assistive technology users don't really use it. It's the elements list. Do you hmm. ever use the elements list? No, no, I That's do not. That's so funny. I, I don't know if it's just because I never had a good explanation of what the elements list does. Um, but yeah, I tend to, to go through by a specific element like headings or maybe the links list. Sure. sure. But no. So, so the for those of you who don't know, the elements list is insert F7 on uh, a uh, for NVDA. I'm not sure what it is for JAWS, but um, the elements list in NVDA only lists the links and headings. So it okay. will give you a list of all links or all headings. There's a radio button at the top when it when the screen opens up. You either can radio button to links or radio button over to headings. Um, and then it will list all the headings kind of in an outline mode um, for you to navigate to. And you can then navigate directly to them from that elements list. Now in JAWS, it's much more powerful because it lists links, graphics, headings, tables, any anything that's identifiable lists it it has a a very robust uh, way to kind of parse through the document and i always thought that was very could be very helpful to get a sense of the the structure of an, a document but i i don't think i've ever met a person who uses at and i've asked that question they said oh yeah i use that all the time i think almost nobody uses it mhm mm mhm mm i maybe it's just Needs a publicity boost. Like here's how, here's how this can <laughs> save you some time, or you know that that's true. That is true. Um. All right. So uh, let's see. So you know, another uh thing that I wanted to ask is, you know, we we as remediators think that there are certain elements like footers, like uh footnotes, mm -hmm. uh and endnotes that are problematic. Uh, and cause grief when it comes to people who use assistive technology. What are the top things for you? I know you've already mentioned kind of if a document doesn't have headings, that that's mm -hmm. a really big, uh, you know, big barrier for you. What are some other things that are, are you know, major barriers in documents that you find? Well, I just think it's fascinating that I, so I don't have as strong of a background in Adobe as I do. I, I would say Microsoft Word is probably 
the way sure. I create docs the most. Um, and then Google Docs is a great way to collaborate with people. If there's something that I'm writing by myself before I show it to people, I write it in Word first and then I'll throw it in Google. Um, and I guess my biggest frustration from that perspective is just that when uh, I finally translate it to a PDF, some of the great tagging I have done does not come across oh, along yes. with it. No, that, so. that, that, is, that is a problem, right? So from yeah. a content creation standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, Google Docs does not export tags at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, you have to use a third party plugin called Grackle Docs and it, it works okay, but it's not, you know, not the best thing in the world, but you spend all this time in this live environment. You're like right. heading level one, <laughs> like, heading level two. I know two. I made this accessible, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah. that's what a lot of people don't know as an organization. Mm -hmm. If your whole organization is based on Google Docs and now you've got to make all your deliverables accessible, you have just created a mountain of work for yourself right. because of the program you chose, right? Uh -huh. We talk about Canva all the time, the same kind of way. Canva cannot make an accessible document. In fact, I was uh, uh, working with someone this morning on a PDF and they're like, I can't get this list to separate correctly so that I can tag the number as the label and the text as the text. It it just doesn't want to tag correctly. And of course, I even before I looked at where the document was from, I said, I bet it's a Canva document, huh? Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. said, yes, it is. It's because of the the core structure behind that document that it kind of wants to glue the wrong things together. And so as uh, remediators, we have a really tough time kind of separating those things back out. And, uh, you know, we, we know that Canva is on a journey for accessibility. They're trying to get things to be better. And in some areas like their, their Canva, their slides, they are okay, but most people are using Canva to create full on documents, you know, real eight and a half by 11, you know, handouts and things. So, um, caution to everyone. Make sure if you choose a platform, you test it to see if it can export your content accessibly. It's a, yeah. a huge roadblock if you you kind of commit to one thing and realize it doesn't it doesn't produce. Yeah, and then I guess uh, another issue from a document reading standpoint is it's always good as the user or as a reader, um, and of course you don't always have time, but to take the time to go through the reading settings in Adobe. Oh, uh -huh. And make sure that they're, and it's really funny how sometimes uh, just infer reading order uh, from the document itself works better. And then other times left to right, top to bottom reading order works better. Um, I just think that's hilarious. Depending on well, you know, what's interesting is you only get that when it's an untagged document. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that only, so when you open an Acrobat document and it's not tagged at all, mm -hmm. Acrobat says, hey, there are no tags in this document. Right. We're going to try we to we're going to try to read it for you. Which method do you want us to use mm -hmm. and and, and kind of go there? I will tell you that I used to be the the biggest deterrer of using auto tag features in Acrobat, but I will tell you I auto tagged the document last night with form fields in it and it did a great job. Nice. I would love to see Adobe give that feature to someone using assistive technology to say, hey, this document doesn't have tags. Do you want us to try to auto tag it and mm -hmm. see what we get? Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that would be a huge feature because right now, if you want to auto tag a document, you have to know to go into the tags panel, create a root tag and then tell it to auto tag versus, you know, walking through it kind of more uh, in a discovery kind of way. So yeah, yeah, and I think once it allows people who use AT to auto tag, uh, I don't know. Then the possibilities really open up for you know being able to correct things and fix things. We were yeah, um, that's a little yeah. harder though because if you don't have sight, mm -hmm. you can't tell if something's incorrect, right? Yeah. If, if if this thing is marked as a paragraph tag, you can't tell that it's actually the title of the document or the heading of this section. Um, so that's always the drawback. We get we get people from time to time who are blind who say, hey, I'd love to get into document accessibility and making documents accessible. And I say, well, you can, but it's kind of a caveat. You have to have a sighted person to work in tandem with so you can report what your user experience is and then they can look at the things that are on the page and say, okay, does the user experience match the visual, you know, information that's there? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, Liza and I had a fun one where the alt text wasn't translating to Jaws uh, for oh, a photo, okay. but it was to NVDA. <laughs> Just oh, interesting. To, yeah. Wow. Uh, and then we... Um, she showed me how to get into the tag tree, and then I went in, and apparently the photo had some kind of photo ID because um, when I it did it from Google, I like went into insert image, you know, insert uh -huh. the source file, blah blah. Anyway, some at some point along its journey, it had an image ID. When the image ID number was removed, it read the description. So I was like, what? Anyway, oh. just one of those wild interesting things that happen. Yeah, well, documents. you know what's interesting is I I would I would venture to say that it mm -hmm. might have put that ID in the actual text field, mm -hmm. and so it was reading that. So when you have alt text and actual text, two different fields that really should never be together, an option. The yeah. actual text field will always win over mm -hmm. the alt text field. So you're like, hey, why am I getting this ID? So it was a matter of how it exported without seeing it. I can't say for sure. Yeah, that's yeah, just my sure. speculation. Yeah. So, um. So. As we close out this episode, I want to ask you if there was one thing that people could focus on making sure they get right in their documents when they're considering people who use assistive technology, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> one What's the thing? one thing that helps you the most? Uh -huh. What is the one thing that you're like, man, I am so tired of this thing being uh -huh. wrong yeah. every time I open a document? Uh, well, I mean... Just start somewhere might be my <laughs> my first thing. Okay, because sure. there are amazing number of documents still that start nowhere, and uh -huh. you know you open them and I have no idea what it says. So I feel like, I mean, Marty always calls it progress over perfection, but you know, yeah. even if you don't have the document one hundred and ten percent of the way there, at least start it, <laughs> do something, sure. uh, and it will make it more readable. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the basics are headings, mm -hmm. use styles to make your headings correct, right? Mm -hmm. And describe your images. If you can do those two things, I got to believe that's a huge improvement over no tags at all, right? Yes. Yeah. I would say that's, I don't know, maybe like 70% of my reading experience or something. Maybe not that much, but certainly if you have headings and then labeled graphics, it's like, oh, I know how this goes and I can understand it. So then other issues awesome. become much smaller. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for taking the time to to you know join us and really give your perspective on uh, documents and the the journey with assistive technology and kind of what those barriers are. We appreciate you. Thank you. I look forward to learning more from you as we work more together. I really appreciate yeah, talking to you. Yeah, awesome. And for those of you who don't know, TAMIN is the organization that has is now the parent organization of uh, Chax Training Consulting. While we are still the same organization, we now have the mothership, which is TAMIN Inc. And they do uh, accessible uh, apps, websites, and um, programming for accessibility. So, uh, you know, if you're interested more about information, uh, head on over to TAMIN Inc. Dot com t a m m a n inc dot com. Um, yeah. So once again, we want to thank our sponsors uh, for this podcast, which is Creative Pro Week. If you are in the DC area or you are want to go to DC, uh, feel free to go over to Creative Pro and look for information on the uh, Creative Pro Week which is gonna be packed with so many powerhouse speakers, not just on accessibility, but on uh, photos and documents and InDesign and Photoshop and Illustrator and all sorts of great stuff. And then of course, the Design and Accessibility Summit happening in October, which is an online event if your company isn't willing to pay for you to go fly somewhere. It's a great way to spend a few days, it's actually four days, uh, to listen to some amazing content on uh, accessibility all over the gambit. Then we're gonna have a bunch of uh, HR stuff this year where we're focusing on organizational, maybe not HR, but for focusing on organizational accessibility. How do I start an or, uh, accessibility program in my organization? Um, what should I consider from an HR standpoint? Lots of different things. So feel, you know, be sure to join us for that event. Again, both of those uh, conferences can be found at creativepro.com. So once again, thank you, Kristen, for being with us. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Dax. Thanks for having me. My name is Dax Castro, where each week we unravel accessibility for you.